to this morning's webinar. Uh, this is one that I have been looking forward to for quite a while uh, for a couple reasons that I will get into in just a bit. Um, I think it is a timely topic to be looking at deterrence. Um, we certainly didn't plan it this way, but I've noticed that deterrence is one of those words that's been back in the headlines recently uh, with the ongoing visit in Taiwan um, and the responses to it. Obviously, today we'll be focusing a little bit more on Southern Asia, which is a region where I think we're also seeing the, the impact of U.S.-China competition playing out. Uh, we've seen a strategic chain of competition developing that's linked the U.S. to China, to India and Pakistan. Um, and this fantastic panel of experts that we've assembled today um, is going to be diving into those issues and, and answering your questions. The other thing we're doing this morning, and, and something I'm quite proud of, um, is we are launching our latest online course. Um, it's called Restoring Deterrence, Coercion and Crises in Southern Asia. Um, you'll hear a little bit about that later from my colleague Zeba Fosley. But my job today is just kind of to give a sense of uh, why we started building out these courses and what we're aiming to achieve with them. Um, you know, I think I'm very cognizant that um, I was very fortunate sitting here in Washington to have had the education that I did, the opportunities that I did to study issues of deterrence and compellence and coercion um, in an academic setting. Um, I think probably many of you have done the same, uh, but that's certainly not an opportunity that's available to everyone. And these are issues that impact everyone, um, and increasingly so. And so we began our strategic learning initiative a few years back um, in order to build out online courses that would make these strategic issues more accessible um, and more legible to a wider audience. Um, they're free for everyone. They always will be. Um, and you can sign up on our website. You'll hear more about that in a bit. Um, this latest course that we're launching today, it does delves into the theory and practice of coercion in clear language. It has really engaging content and only takes about three hours to get through and you'll get a certificate at the end. We also have courses on the history and development of strategic issues on the subcontinent, including nuclear doctrines and postures. And we also have a longer form course on deterrence. Um, so if you really like the short version, that's a great resource if you want to learn more. Uh, I couldn't, uh, we wouldn't be here today um, without the generosity of our funders, without the insights of the experts that we interviewed in building out these courses, um, and of course, without the dedication of our team. Uh, so really, a congrats and a hats off to my colleagues, primarily Zeba Fosley, Betzal Newman, and Uzair Sattar. Uh, very, very grateful for our, all their hard work um, and looking forward to uh, launching the course today and also to hearing from uh, this fantastic panel of experts that we've assembled. Um, they're going to be diving into these issues and taking your questions. So uh, really looking forward to the conversation. Thanks again for joining us. Um, and without further ado, I will hand things over to Zeba. Thank you so much, Elizabeth. And hello to everyone joining us from around the world. Again, my name is Ava Fuzzley. I'm a research associate here at Stimson and the project leader for the Strategic Learning Initiative. I am so thrilled to be able to be here with you all to celebrate the launch of our newest online course, Restoring Deterrence, um, and to moderate what's sure to be a really engaging and, and wide ranging panel uh, discussion. So first, allow me to introduce our fantastic panelists. They're from across Southern Asia and the US, and they have a variety of backgrounds and experiences thinking about working on and really helping us all better understand and analyze strategic dynamics in Southern Asia and beyond. And we're really excited to have them with us today. So first up, we have Colin Jackson, who is the chair of the Strategic and Operational Research Department at the Naval War College. We also have with us Shuja Nawaz, who is a distinguished fellow at the Atlantic Council's South Asia Center. Um, thirdly, we have Sushant Singh, who is a senior fellow at the Center for Policy Research in New Delhi. And last, but by no means least, we have Katian Zhang, an assistant professor at the Shar School of Policy and Government at George Mason University. Um, I should add that Katian and Sushant are uh, both good friends of the Strategic Learning Initiative and are featured in Restoring Deterrence. Um, but we're really excited to uh, have everyone today uh, with us to have a broad discussion about strategic dynamics and deterrence. Um, now, before we get into the discussion, I do wanted to say a little bit more about the course. Um, so as Elizabeth mentioned, the intent behind it, which, uh, which we spun off of our 2020 long form course on deterrence in Southern Asia, 
is to give students, no matter their, who they are, what their level of knowledge is, the tools to understand and analyze the role of co coercion and competition in Southern Asia. So whether you're an undergrad, just learning about international relations for the first time, if you're an analyst working on these issues in a professional capacity, if you're in government, the private sector, or whatever your vantage point is, if you want to expand your thinking, learn from diverse perspectives and experts from around the world, then restoring deterrence, I think, is the course for you. Um, as Elizabeth mentioned, we, we designed this one particularly with accessibility and legibility in mind. So it's approachable, it's clear um, in kind of describing these really big ideas and explaining them um, and how they relate to um, modern day strategic dynamics. Uh, but we also have the interactivity and high quality analysis that I think are hallmarks of strategic learning courses. Uh, plus it's short and sweet. This one takes only about three hours to complete. Um, so it's very easy to fit into busy schedules, whether at school or at work or what have you. Um, now I've talked a little bit, but I think it might be more useful to show you some of the course content. Um, so to that end, uh, if you'll bear with me for a moment, I'm going to share uh, the trailer for our course, which is also available online. Uh, just give me one moment. All right. We have reestablished deterrence, but we know it's not everlasting, that risk remains. We are determined not to lose that deterrence. Technology must become a means of deterrence and not a source of destruction. Ki minimum deterrent hona chahiye. Pakistan have worked for deterrence to be strengthened in South Asia comprehensively. Leaders around the world, from the United States to India to Pakistan, often talk about deterring their rivals. But what is deterrence? And what role does it play in Southern Asia today? Explore these questions and more in Restoring Deterrence, a free online course from the Stimson Center's Strategic Learning Initiative. In this interactive, intuitive course, you'll learn about concepts like deterrence, compellence, and coercion, and study how they apply to the conflicts that shape our world. I felt that there was a good mix of academ academia as well as um, practical examples of how the states have behaved in the past, as well as it gets you thinking of how they're likely to behave in the future. So this course really gives you a lot of information about uh, what is the role of nuclear weapons in maintaining strategic stability in Southern Asia. Hear from experts in Southern Asia, the US and beyond, and see how deterrence has evolved over time from the Cuban Missile Crisis of the Cold War to today's complex interplay linking Pakistan, India, China, and the United States. What particularly stood out to me is the inclusion of China in understanding the regional dynamics, which is definitely interesting and very relevant. The experts do provide very valuable insights in understanding the unique strategic environment in uh, South Asia. Tension is building across Southern Asia. As the U.S. and China compete for dominance, India and Pakistan vie for influence, and the region recovers from economic, geopolitical, and public health crises. Now more than ever, it is vital that students, policymakers, and the public understand deterrence, its value, and its limits. Mastering these concepts will help us to build stability and reduce the risk of war. I believe it's a great course for anybody who's interested in strategic studies, students, analysts, even the watchers of strategic issues. From students to policy researchers, whether you're new, whether you've already been using, I think there's something in it for everyone and I would really recommend everyone to take this course. Enroll in Restoring Deterrence for free today. All right, I couldn't say it any better myself. Um, but in any case, as you can see, um, this course is taking a, a look at what deterrence, coercion, and compellence are and how they've played out from the Cold War to today's Southern Asia. Um, ultimately, I think we're, we're hoping that students will be able to answer for themselves the question of what it means to restore deterrence, if that's possible at all. 
Um, now, because this course is only takes about three hours to complete, um, we think it's a really unique and valuable resource, again, for, for busy students and busy professionals alike. Um, so for the instructors, whether you're working at a university or a school um, or in a professional setting, there are several ways that you can give it a shot um, in your own classroom or training sessions. Um, firstly, you can simply promote or recommend it to your, to your students or colleagues as extra reading. Um, you can also integrate just parts of it as supplemental content or reading. So each strategic learning course has both a flex and a complete edition. The flex edition allows you to kind of pick and choose what lessons you take. Uh, and the complete edition is the one that requires you to complete everything in order to earn a certificate. Thirdly, um, you can simply assign the whole course and have your students um, earn a certificate. And then finally, and perhaps most excitingly, I, I would think, is partnering with strategic learning so that we can work more closely with you and your, your institution. Uh, we've held demos, we've held substantive discussions, uh, we've brought in experts to kind of discuss current events and sort of um, build on the themes that we're exploring and, and restoring deterrence in other courses. Um, so if you're at all interested, please don't hesitate to reach out to me or to my team. Um, I'll add that the Strat Learning website also has a whole drive of instructor resources, including explainers, glossaries, transcripts, example lesson plans, reading lists, and, and much more. Uh, and we're always developing more, um, more external resources and downloadable resources. Um, so if that is of interest, I highly recommend you check it out. Um, so once more, um, log in to stratlearning.org to enroll in, in whatever edition of Restoring Deterrence uh, fits your needs and interests. Um, but yeah, thank you so much. We're really excited for you all to sign up and begin your strategic learning journey. But and now that that's over with, um, I'd like to begin our moderated discussion with our fantastic panel of experts. Uh, we'll start with a few questions of my own, and we'll alternate throughout between moderators' questions and audience-submitted questions as appropriate. Um, so speakers, this is your reminder to please keep your responses to about two minutes max so we can get as, to as many questions as possible. And audience members, please uh, be sure to submit your questions in the Q&A box. Um, and share your name and affiliation as you do so. So um, we'll do a first round of about 25 minutes of moderator questions. So again, please make sure to submit your questions, um, audience members. Now, first to kick us off, I'd like to ask all of our speakers to consider what we just saw in the trailer about restoring deterrence, um, about it being um, a course about accessibility and kind of breaking down big ideas for, for all audiences. So in your opinion, why is the public discussion about coercion and strategic issues important in Southern Asia and beyond? In other words, what can a course like this offer to interested publics? Um, so let's go first to Colin, then Ketian, Sushant, and Shuja. So Colin, take it away. Yeah, thank you for uh, having me again. And uh, I appreciate uh, the opportunity to to participate in a forum like this. I think uh, I'd say at the outset, my views are my personal views. They don't represent the views of the United States government, Navy, or uh, Naval War College. But um, I think the significance of studying something like this at this point in time uh, is increasingly self-evident. We're in a situation of sort of mutual coercion dynamics in the Ukraine war. We're uh, in the midst of a standoff over Taiwan issues where uh, tensions are rising dramatically. Um, and we're also in a period where a lot of the introduction of new technologies is arguably either stabilizing or destabilizing or a combination of the two. Uh, as we shift the focus explicitly to the South Asia area, um, I would argue we've had uh, an uncomfortably large number of nuclear or near nuclear crises uh, in South Asia over time. And the dynamics there, the number of near misses uh, is worrisome and focuses the mind. And so I think those are certainly my rationales for why study this now, uh, why be focused on this topic. 
Sure. Um, so, uh, and again, thanks for um, having us. Um, and I think uh, for me, there might be two uh, a rationale for why the public might want to know about um, a deterrence or a norm a little bit more. And the first one is, I think, high politics actually affects individuals' lives, right? So if we take a look at Taiwan as an example, um, China has been uh, using economic sanctions, which, which, which actually might affect, um, I think, small businesses or um, even individual uh, citizens there. And in addition, um, the, the, the the looming prospects of um, military exercises or, or missile tests, for example, um, can also have a psychological impact, even if not a physical one, on um, I think individual citizens' life. And the second rationale is that um, I think um, there are a lot of uh, fear mongering or war mongering sort of um, uh, comments out there, but we want to know what works as deterrence and what does not work from a more, I would say, scientific and, and irrational perspective. So that's why I think it's really even important for the public to know about uh, deterrence and what works and what uh, doesn't. Uh, uh, thank you. Thank you, Zeba. And uh, uh... Congratulations to Stimson Center on the launch of this course. Uh, the reasons I think this course needs to be studied and followed is uh, primarily because we're talking about a region where there are three biggest military powers in the world. If you look at the top ten military powers or top six military powers, and three of the you know, three and all three are nuclear powers as well. And they've been nuclear powers for 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 good enough more than twenty years now, nearly twenty five years, twenty five years now. But that cannot be the most important reason. I think the most important reason for studying it now is the increasing asymmetry in conventional capabilities between the three countries. So China has really taken off vis-a-vis -vis India, whereas India has really, you know, the gap between India and Pakistan has also increased dram dramatically. You know, this increasing gap enhances risks as, you know, as we have nationalist regimes in place, both in Beijing and in New Delhi, and a, a few while ago, a few weeks ago in Pakistan, uh, in Pakistan as well. And the second reason I would say that this needs to be studied is that it's not only about the continental borders, but also about the Indian Ocean region, which seems to be the place of cont contestation right now between all kinds of power and all kinds of countries, which nearly, which is also what abets Southern Asia in, in, that, in that sense. And of course, uh, agreeing with what uh, Katyan said uh, and Colin said about the, about the accidents and something we saw in India earlier this year where a BrahMos missile actually landed inside Pakistan accidentally. Thank you for including me in this uh, program. I'm delighted to be part of this discussion along with the other panelists. Um, in my view, uh, the question uh, revolves around three uh, Cs, uh, connectivity, codependence, and communications. And I think anything that we can do to enhance knowledge about this among the participating countries, uh, and uh, I agree entirely with the outline presented by Sushant that you know you have such an imbalance of power uh, in the three countries within the region. And let's not forget that uh, there is a fresh tinderbox that was, has always been there, which is Afghanistan. We're about the one year anniversary of the rather uh, higgledy-piggledy U.S. withdrawal from Afghanistan. And Russia is now getting involved in the region and in Central Asia. So that's going to complicate things. And let's not forget Iran. So um, Central Asia and South Asia, or Greater South Asia, to my mind, remains the center of gravity of global economics as well as security issues. Uh, I for one, don't subscribe to the, the, the tilt to the Pacific, uh, because this is the area where you have, as Shoshan pointed out correctly, uh, nuclear powers. And the escalation ladder is very steep. And so whatever we can do to build the other factors that will take us away from proceeding up the escalation ladder towards nuclear weapons use um, is going to save the region and the world. And on the counterfactual side, facing the economic difficulties, the climate change, environmental issues that these countries are facing on such a massive scale, if we can get them to build their economies and communicate with each other and trade with each other, then maybe we've achieved deterrence, we've achieved stability. Thank you. Thank you so much, everyone. I think those are all a wide range of answers, but I think the common themes are asymmetry uh, across sort of the strategic chain in Southern Asia and, and concern about stability, accidents, 
and crises of this region have seen. Um, we'll be digging into that, I'm sure, further along in the discussion. Um, but for now, my second question um, is about kind of why we call the course Restoring Deterrence. So as you would have seen in the trailer, um, we're interested in how policymakers and leaders around the world are invoking these big ideas, whether it's deterrence in general, or particularly about restoring or reestablished reestablishing deterrence with their rivals um, on the one hand. And on the second hand, how those ideas are then being understood by national and international audiences. Um, so my question is, what does the term restoring deterrence um, mean in your all's minds? Do you think leaders or audiences in Southern Asia would agree with that perspective? Um, so for this one, let's start with Sushant, then Shuja, uh, and then go to Ketian and Colin. So Sushant, over to you. Yeah. Uh, deterrence to my mind uh, is about, you know, increasing stability of a park and threatening another nuclear power, however big or small. Essentially, that's what deterrence is about. It's, it's broadly, you know, a philosophically creating an environment of peace, which helps you do a lot the amount of populations that live in uh, that live in the Indians did go into Balakot in 2019, uh, which which led to questions or Chinese are coming to Ladakh. Uh, can it fail at a greater degree? Yes, that is always a possibility that remains a possibility. And that's why we are, we, are, we are probably here and we are discussing this topic. Would the leaders in the region agree with the kind of description or the ideas that I have about deterrence or, or restoring deterrence? I doubt the Indian lead, political leadership is very clear that it would want to take away parts of Kashmir, which are with Pakistan, or maybe even have greater ambitions about what it wants to do. China has similar ambitions about Arunachal Pradesh, about Ladakh, Aksai Chin, et cetera, et cetera. So, you know, so there is un, it is unlikely that the leadership in these countries would agree with the kind of ideas that come into my mind when I think about restoring deterrence. I think also that uh, leaders within these countries uh, don't want to relive history. Uh, I think that is critical. Um, if you look at the history of, of, of the, the three countries, China, India, and Pakistan, there, there have been numerous conflicts. Uh, and, and, and some have been bigger than others. And in, in one case, in, in the conflict in 1971, it led to the breakup of what was originally the state of Pakistan with two wings, East Pakistan and, and West Pakistan. So there's been trauma associated with it. There was trauma associated with the, the Indo-Chinese war. Um, and that is something that, it, that cannot, those, I think you, to use last world's phrase, those scratches on the minds of India cannot be erased or filled. Uh, and so the question now is, uh, what can the leaders in the in the countries do to take us towards a counterfactual, where you can eliminate the threat of conflict and create the possibility of communication and trade, which is to some extent already very successful between India and China, but awfully unsuccessful between India and Pakistan. So looking at a more regional perspective, with other global powers like Russia and China and maybe the Arabian Peninsula playing an enabling role uh, may well be the, the way out. Uh, and I hope that we can persuade the leaders in these countries to come up with those solutions so that we are not talking about going up the ladder, but eliminating the ladder entirely. Um, I think I very much agree with um, uh, both Sushan and Shujat, and I uh, wanted to add that uh, restoring deterrence is a really, I think, nice uh, concept to capture the dynamic process of deterrence in the sense that sometimes deterrence works and sometimes it does, it does not, right? There, there's always um, success or failure. So it's sort of a cyclical pattern of um, crisis and crisis um, management. And I think restoring deterrence in a way captures uh, the fact that deterrence is dynamic, it's not a, a static a concept. And as for whether um, uh, the leaders might agree with the concept of um, uh, uh, restoring deterrence, um, in a way, I think they might. But at the same time, um, I think especially um, uh, using South Asia as an example, 
the leaders, uh, for example, between India and China, their perceptions of what is the status quo, what is sort of the baseline for deterrence might be actually very different. So they might in their own mind want to uh, restore deterrence to what they think their status quo is. Think about the line of actual control as an example, but in the process of trying to restore deterrence to their perceived status quo, there might be um, uh, conflicts or crises that arrive out of the the, the uh, different perceptions about what is a status quo and what is a deterrence. Yeah, I I would uh, I would accept sort of uh, you know the vast majority of the the points that were made here. I, I would emphasize a couple uh, of other ones here. I think the phrase restoring credibility is is uh, fascinating because uh, leaders of various different countries all invoke it, even when it appears to be mutually contradictory. How can various powers in tension with each other restore credibility? I think the most interesting piece of it is what this rests on implicitly. Credibility rests on at least two elements, it seems to me. One is capability. And uh, Sushant talked to this question of uh, asymmetries, both in the conventional and nuclear domains. Uh, but it also speaks to resolve the uh, willingness of a party to follow through either on the threats it makes or on the assurances it provides to an adversary. So what do I mean by that? Uh, frequently in a deterrent uh, situation, uh, the power that is sending the message says, I don't want you to do the following. Uh, if you do the following, I will uh, do X, Y, or Z to you. But at the same time, to be effective, you say, if you refrain from that activity, then I won't do all sorts of bad things to you in return. The problem is if your threats and your assurances uh, to uh, the target of this deterrent message uh, is impaired, uh, if you do not follow through on your threats, if you do not follow through on your assurances, uh, there's a danger that in subsequent uh, competitions, people will not take you seriously, uh, that you will be pushed around by various players. And I think this is why this is an appealing concept, saying restoring deterrence presumes that it's been impaired. And it's fascinating that all parties in the great power competition appear to think that their credibility is impaired. Um, so I think the game is about how one communicates resolve, that your threats and assurances are real, that you mean it, um, and you accumulate it by following through on the statements you make, and you diminish it when you fail to follow through on it. And one of the ones, for instance, in past U.S. stuff that is pointed to quite a bit is the notion that Obama made commitments, let's say, in Syria uh, uh, to go after sort of chemical weapons use. Uh, and then he, he steps back from what, that apparent threat when uh, the adversary does what he asked them not to do. A lot of people in US policy circles has that diminished US credibility in subsequent crises. We could argue about whether that's the case, but those are the sort of dynamics that I think are in the background. Excellent, thank you all so much. Um, those are great answers and I think gets to a lot of the, the questions and themes that come up in restoring deterrence to the course, as well as in kind of the larger question of what is restoring deterrence. Um, now I think we'll, I'll transition to a couple of sort of substantive and current events questions. Um, so Kessian and Colin, as Elizabeth said up top, it's a fun time to be having this discussion given um, the, uh, prominence of Taiwan and the Nancy Pelosi visit in the headlines just today and yesterday. Um, so U.S. Speaker of the House, Nancy Pelosi, uh, arrived in Taiwan yesterday, met with politicians, um, and also met with strong warnings from China about future actions and, and, and um, exercises that I believe will, are supposed to take place this week. Um, so my question for, for the two of you, um, is how might China respond to demonstrate that its attempts at coercive signaling, although they were unsuccessful in deterring Pelosi's visit um, in the first place, are being backed by action? So I think this gets also to what both Colin and Kachian were saying um, about communicating resolve and following through with threats. So let's start with, with Kachian and then go to Colin. Yeah, sure thing. Um, and I think in, in this case, obviously, it's still evolving and we're sort of um, currently observing China's um, um, reactions and and um, it's fairly possible that it's going to continue for the next couple of uh, months or so. Um, so in a way, China 
considers uh, uh, House Speaker Nancy Pelosi's visit as a deterrence failure from, from China's perspective. And therefore, I think it's using coercion to sort of um, um, try to deter future occurrences uh, of uh, such uh, visits. So in a way, it is trying to restore deterrence uh, from, from, from China's uh, perspective. And I think as of now, and as you've mentioned, uh, we're seeing China announcing um, um, large scale military um, exercises all around the uh, all around Taiwan, which is not dissimilar to the third Taiwan Strait crisis of 1995 and six, and think which which this uh, this course actually also talks about, um, and um, the scale might be a lot a little bit uh, larger because I think there are um, uh, indications that um, uh, uh, missiles uh, Chinese missiles might actually fly over Taiwan some airspace, but um but but currently I think we're we're still observing uh, what's going to happen, and in addition to military coercion, um, and this is something different from the 19. 1955 and 6 Taiwan Strait crisis, China is also using economic sanctions and very targeted economic sanctions against Taiwan, including banning um, certain Taiwanese uh, uh, fruits and products into China, which uh, is um, what we are seeing in more recent years, which is using non-military coercive measures uh, to uh, basically restore uh, deterrence. Um, and for the rest, I'll uh, defer to Colin um, for more information. So I, I agree with uh, what uh, Ketian is, is putting forward on that sort of localized crisis. What I would point to is, is a, um, a related point that there's a kind of a general coercive struggle that's going on in the background. This is a local and particular instance in that competition. I would say that what appears to be happening here is the United States is, the United States is trying to deter what it perceives as Chinese attempts to coerce Taiwan into unification. That's the sort of backdrop. And from the Chinese point of view, they're trying to deter the United States from altering the status quo. That's the way that they would communicate this. Uh, they may also be trying both in military and non-military ways uh, to persuade uh, Taiwan to unify with the mainland. So that's the sort of backdrop against which this particular crisis emerges. Uh, what's interesting is, again, both sides are trapped in this sort of interesting signaling and resolve problem. Um, the, the Chinese state wants to make sure uh, that it is not seen as uh, unwilling to follow through on threats, but it wants to restore um, credibility without, almost in parentheses, creating an explosion, right? And most great powers are engaged in this game of wanting what they want or seeking to prevent what they don't want, but without a catastrophic outcome. And so it seems to me not accidental that the, that the PRC is doing a bundle of actions which show seriousness without necessarily leading to an inadvertent explosion. And on the US side, I think the sense is once the Pelosi visit had been leaked, it put the United States government and including Representative Pelosi in a tough position. If they were seen to back down in the visit, they too would lose credibility and resolve in this attempt to sort of bolster what they see as certainly a partner in East Asia uh, in, in the Taiwan government. So it's very, very interesting how both sides, these things tend to be either bi or trilateral, uh, and all parties are attempting to communicate resolve while stopping short of a catastrophic or uncontrolled uh, explosion of violence on some level. All right, thank you both so much. Um, I know it's it's an evolving situation, but I think it's one um, that has a lot of uh, overlap uh, thematically and, and substantively with what we cover in the course. Um, I think my next couple of questions are gonna focus on the India and China border conflict. So I'll start with Ketian. Um, so you recently published a paper um, analyzing why China has increased its use of military coercion in its border dispute with India over time. So I was wondering if you could walk us through the reasons for this um, and how we've seen this increased use of military coercion play out in recent events, um, given reports that China is, you know, building a village in Bhutanese territory in Doklam, conducting air, tra air, tra ugh, air drill, sorry, along the LAC, um, and kind of the evolving um, situation across that border. Um, sure thing. Um, so I'm going to uh, try to very briefly sort of uh, describe what, what the paper um, argues. So the basic argument is a contrast between China's use of military coercion um, along uh, the, the, the Sino-Indian border 
uh, with uh, China's uh, use of non-militarized coercion, including reason coercion in maritime disputes in the South China Sea. Sorry, so the uh, the contrast is that China uses military coercion more, um, starting from around 2006 vis-a-vis -vis India, whereas uh, starting from around the same time, um, the frequency of coercion increases vis-a-vis -vis maritime disputes in the South China Sea, but um, China tends to use non-militarized, including reason uh, coercion. So I think that the key uh, 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 rationale for uh, explaining this difference is that um, the perceived geopolitical backlash cost vis-a-vis -vis India or Southeast Asian states uh, are very different. So from China's perspective, um, um, the United States is much more likely to get involved into a militarized conflict uh, in the South China Sea because the United States is uh, treaty allies with, for example, the Philippines, and the stakes are a lot higher, uh, but China just simply does not believe that the stakes are high enough for the United States to get involved militarily in a, a border clash between China and um, India. So that's why I think uh, in recent years, we're seeing um, uh, an increase of the use of a military coercion uh, alongside the uh, the Sino-India uh, land uh, border um, area. And I'd be more than happy to uh, share a link of this um, article so that for those interested, you can sort of have a, a, a broader picture or a bigger picture of um, what the article is marking. All right, thank you so much. No, I think it's it's such an interesting um, development to be tracing and again, increasingly relevant. So for Sushant, I think the, the other side of that question is that since the Ladakh standoff um, and that began in, in the spring of 2020, the Indian army has reportedly moved six divisions uh, from the border with Pakistan to Ladakh um, to sort of prevent further PLA incursions. But um, as we've seen over the last, you know, over two years now, Indian leaders have been continually reluctant to discuss or publicly acknowledge ongoing Chinese coercion in these dispu dis disputed border regions. Um, so I'm curious, uh, from your perspective, how is the Indian military conceptualizing deterrence against China? And what is their, de their decision to, to not engage in public discussions um, about Chinese incursions mean for their ability to deter future face accomplice or uh, restore the status quo ante as they see it? Um, so the first thing, uh, the uh, the Indian strategy or the Indian military planners do not use the word deterrence with respect to China. The word that I have heard mostly used by former service chiefs or, or people who have dealt with this issue is dissu dissuasion. Now, I understand there is a bit of overlap between dissuasion and deterrence, but the idea is that somehow we will use all aspects of na national power in using diplomatic and using global partnerships and alliances to somehow keep uh, China away from uh, doing 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 what it needs to what it needs to do uh, coming specifically to nuclear weapons there's actually no discussion of nuclear weapons uh, in the indo in the in the india china relationship the last time an indian official spoke of nuclear weapons with respect to china was when india tested its uh, nuclear weapons officially in 1998 then indian defense minister george fernandez spoke about spoke about it that primarily also comes from the fact that prc's uh, prc also has a no first use no first use policy and india also has a no first use policy uh, that is as far as the idea of deterrence uh, uh, de deterrence is de deterrence is concerned uh, with, with respect to with respect to china but coming to the more important question how does prc look at the way the leadership has dealt with the crisis. I think they very clearly, the silence, this complete, uh, you know, uh, desire by the Indian political leadership to keep, to push it under the carpet, that nothing has happened. Uh, they see that it's a sign of, pol uh, of political weakness in, a, in an environment where they cannot afford to tell their domestic audience uh, that this is what is actually going on, going, going, going on, go, uh, going on in the border. In almost an inversion of what people used to say about China, it is about that Mr. Narendra Modi, Prime Minister Narendra Modi cannot afford to lose face vis-a-vis -vis China in front of his in, in in front of his own people. And that's why you see since July 2021, and we're talking about what 13 months, there's been no further disengagement, de-escalation, de-induction from the from the Ladakh area. The last time, and there have been 16 rounds of military talks, but there's virtually no progress in the in, in moving any forces away for last for last 13 for last uh, for last 13 months. The areas which are militarily very important to India, Depsang, Dem, Demchok, on these areas, Chinese have 
consistently refuse to discuss. These are the areas where they have come and blocked, particularly the area of Depth Sang, uh, up close to the Karakoram Pass, uh, about which a lot has been written because this is the only area where China and Pakistan can physically meet, affects the Siachen Glacier, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. There are all the all the other all the other all the other reasons are there. And fundamentally, the point to recognize, as Ketin also said, that they have changed the status quo. The PRC has changed the status quo in Ladakh. The, the kind of infrastructure that they have created, the kind of deployments that they have done, the kind of options that they have created. Uh, to give you a simple example, everybody talks about the 1962 Sino-India War. In the 1962 India, uh, Sino-India War, or up till the 1980s, the Indians used to believe that Chinese would require one full season to actually mobilize and they would launch a war in the next season. Till a decade back, we used to hear about a month's time. Now we are talking about a week's time. And some military officers say that it could be even lesser than a week in which China could come. So the status quo ante, which India wants to restore uh, as of April 2020, that's, that's a, that is gone. And this creates a very big risk for the future. And if I may connect it to the current situation, uh, if, if President Xi Jinping is humiliated over Taiwan, what happens in Ladakh? That's a question which which none of us really know what, what really happens at that point. Well, that's that's a great and very sobering extended question. I'm sure we'll we'll find out the answer um, over the next week, a couple of weeks. Okay, great. Um, it looks like we have regained Shuja. Um, so let me give him a moment. I welcome back Shuja. I hope everything's okay. Yes, I have uh, electrical work being done in the apartment and somebody switched off the power to my base unit. <laughs> Sorry oh about dear. that. Well, welcome back. Um, you. You're just in time. In fact, we were going to, I was going to turn to you and Sushant to yes. kind of talk through um, India-Pakistan relations. So yes. um, we're in a sort of deceptively calm period these days in India-Pakistan conflict in that it has been somewhat quiet, but there's a lot of concern about the potential for escalation in a future India-Pakistan crisis. Um, on top of that, there are lots of other things um, on the horizon in the region. Shuja, you mentioned um, Afghanistan and the Taliban. Um, there's risks of instability in Pakistan. We just saw Imran Khan's government um, replaced with uh, Shabazz Sharif's. Um, and in India, there, I think, increasingly emboldened domestically. And so altogether, there are a lot of incentives for both countries to sort of signal greater resolve next time. Um, so to both of you, I'd like to pose the question, um, given these seemingly unfavorable political conditions, um, what steps can India and Pakistan still take to prevent future crisis instability? And, and, what, and I think the extended question would be, how does your assessment compare to traditional thinking about deterrence in um, India and Pakistan, respectively. Um, so, Shuja, I'll start with you and then go to Sushant. Okay, I'm glad you mentioned Afghanistan because uh, that is in the news now with the killing of uh, Ayman al Zahiri. And there are still unanswered questions as to what role, if any, Pakistan played in that, either by allowing US drones to take off from Pakistani territory because they don't have the range to loiter over Kabul if they fly from Doha. And that's a reality. Um, but um, let me just remind uh, our, our audience that Afghanistan will remain the center of instability in the region. And it also offers an opportunity for both India and Pakistan to work together to try and restore some uh, sanity and balance to the Afghan political entity. Because, uh, and here I'm speaking as an American, I think we made a serious mistake in the very, uh, haphazard withdrawal that uh, took place a year ago from Kabul. It reminded me of Brent Scowcroft uh, telling me uh, when we were talking about the earlier withdrawal from Afghanistan, that whenever the US leaves unfinished business in Afghanistan, it has to go back in to fix it. And so I think we're going to be facing that kind of a situation in the region. Uh, the two players that can play a role in calming things down and working with the Taliban and, and ensuring that they allow participation and pluralism to exist within their country are India and Pakistan, because Afghanistan depends on them for trade. It depends on them for training. It, it depends on, on them as an outlet to the rest of the world, uh, other than Iran. And so uh, when General Kurila, the CENTCOM commander, went in, in June uh, to Central Asia, 
and he met the, the leaders of Uzbekistan, Tajikistan, uh, Kyrgyzstan, uh, and Kazakhstan, they told him that there were three things that mattered to them. It, and, the, and they were Afghanistan, Afghanistan, Afghanistan. Because they're worried of Afghanistan becoming yet another center for terrorist groups, not within the control of the Taliban government. And that is going to be bad news for all the countries of the region, including Iran, including Pakistan, and including India. Because uh, whatever happens on the Afghanistan-Pakistan border will have repercussions in India. Uh, and particularly if they use proxies like the Balochistan Liberation Army or, or, or other such entities as Pakistan alleges. So the, the situation inside India and Pakistan is really critical. Uh, the economic challenges are, are enormous. They have to go back on the growth path. The, the weather and climate that I've mentioned before have now turned for the worse. And we, we've got flooding, uh, we've got cyclones, all kinds of activities that are beyond the control of the government. There has to be another way of living together in that part of the world. Uh, and simply going back to going up the escalation ladder in terms of conventional or nuclear weaponry is not the answer. No, Shuja has spoken about Afghanistan in detail and uh, Indian policy on Afghanistan has been very different this time around because they've, uh, they've started engaging with the Taliban. They've got a kind of a quasi-diplomatic setup there. They're providing infrastructure. They're, they're sending wheat. They're sending medicines. And actually, it's a surprise that such a, a deep and detailed engagement is happening with the Taliban. Uh, moving away from Afghanistan, I think I'll, I'll read out the standard template of things which we've been hearing for the last 20, 30 years as to what India and Pakistan can do. You know, open lines of communication, get all the protocols going, sign new agreements, have those deals on low-hanging fruits like the Sir Creek, which can be which can be agreed upon. But essentially, the point is the political leadership of the two countries need to start engaging again. That engagement has completely stopped over the last few years. That engagement has to happen. And I think particularly I speak for India, uh, if not for Pakistan, the nationalistic uh, rhetoric in the countries have to come down because that, that especially in, in our part of the world, the, with, with the very, you know, raucous, de raucous dem democracies, uh, that kind of thing can lead to, uh, lead to a lot of pressure on the political leadership to, to take actions, uh, which may not be conducive, conducive for peace. But in this case, vis-a-vis -vis India and Pakistan, what has really kept India honest over the last couple of years is the Chinese pressure. The fact that India chose to spoke to Pakistan uh, in late 2020 was because there was a genuine worry that Pakistan army could mobilize certain troops on the line of control on, in Kashmir onto the India border. And the Indian military would find it really tough to deal with both the borders at the same time. And I think that is the kind of pressure which led India to open some lines of communication with, with, with Pakistan, uh, which led to the reiteration of the ceasefire on the line of control in Kashmir, and even otherwise some kind of back channel communication ha has has, conti has continued has continued uh, has continued si since. To the second part of your question, you know, the Indian military actually the armed forces, and I'm not talking about the political leadership here, uh, looks at the window just before the nuclear weapons come into play for undertaking their operations. That has been their theory over the last 20 years. Uh, in their war games, etc., they they hardly talk about the use of use of nuclear weapons, and I think that's one si big significant difference between India and Pakistan in that case. Uh, but there's a downside to it, and as we saw during the Balakot episode in 2019, when Indian uh, Air Force planes crossed into Pakistan, not just into Kashmir, Pakistan controlled Kashmir, Pakistan administered Kashmir, but actually into Pakistan pro proper in Khyber Pakhtunkhwa province and targeted the seminary at, Bal at Balakot. Uh, that clearly tells me that the Indian military leadership and the political leadership somehow believes that they can control the escalation ladder and, and are willing to climb it. At one level, it seems very reckless and risk risky. At a political level, it, it is full of bravado, pays domestic political results during elections. So there is an incentive for incentive for doing it. Uh, but my fear and is that this may actually push Pakistan to a wall uh, where we are actually we are actually leading to a situation where deterrence could completely uh, could completely break down, and that's a risk which people who are concerned with Southern Asia should recognize. If you just look at two incidents, Balakot, and the fact that a BrahMos missile could accidentally be launched and was actually going towards a Pakistani airbase, landing a few miles short uh, because of whatever reasons, uh, I think that should leave us worried about uh, about the situation in, in this part of the world. 
All right, thank you so much. Um, a lot to chew on there. Um, again, very sobering assessments. Um, we have a couple of audience questions, both in the Q&A and from our, our Twitter and YouTube audiences. Um, so first, I'm going to ask Ketian, um, could you please expand on your previous comments regarding differing perceptions of the status quo between India and China? Uh, specifically, uh, they ask, how is China used an evolving status quo definition to underline its territorial or strategic interests in the past? And how might that further complicate its ongoing tensions with India? Great. Um, thank you. Thank you so much for uh, for the question. Um, I think this does not just apply to uh, uh, the Sino-India land border uh, dispute. Um, I think the, the the what is a status quo in uh, or what is considered to be a status quo in territorial disputes uh, is a very a vague term. I think for all parties, um, and we can see that in maritime disputes in the South China Sea um, as well. But for the Sino-India uh, land border case, um, I think that the one of the issues is that the line of actual control where the LAC um, is different size perceive, perceive it differently as in where the line of actual control um, actually lies, right? So there's not, it's not an agreed upon sort of a, a line. So otherwise there would have been a, a, a sound Indian land, land border. Um, so starting from around 2006, uh, because China has had an increased capacity, um, especially military capacity uh, on the Tibetan plateau, it's been increasing the patrols of, uh, we're along the LAC uh, in the Sano Indian uh, land border, which I think in turn is perceived by India as a change in the status quo because of the increase of patrol. Uh, because in a way, the more patrol um, you do, it might be perceived as the other side as uh, increasing your claim strength to the territorial uh, dispute uh, or, or the res respective territorial dispute. Um, and in, in turn, I think there are at least from China's perspective, um, there are um, actions taken by India to increase India's uh, 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 claim strength in terms of the uh, territorial uh, dispute. So China actually considers, I think, the the twenty, I believe it's twenty seventeen Dockland incident, uh, starting from, uh, for example, India's um, um, actions. And so this is sort of, uh, I guess, I view it as a, a, a negative feedback loop of um, uh, perceived changes to uh, status quo along the LEC from both sides. And, um, and that's, I think, partially why we're seeing um, uh, an uptick of China's use of military coercion to restore what it believes to be uh, the, um, the, the correct, say, status quo along the LEC, um, so to speak. Um, so in a way, um, it could be um, uh, uh, destabilizing, but I, at the same time, I think as Colin said earlier about the current, uh, some people call it the, the fourth time and strike crisis, and I think it's a nice way to characterize it, um, that both sides are still in constant communication with one another, including the military uh, on both, in both China and India. So it's, um, uh, it's I, I don't think it's as destabilizing, destabilizing even though the dif difference in terms of uh, what is the status quo is definitely a thorny issue in both land border and maritime territorial uh, disputes. Thank you, Katyan. Uh, Sushant, you've been nodding a lot. Do you have anything to add to that question or to that answer? I, th I, I think I, I agree with, the, with her. There's nothing much I can add to them. Awesome. All right. And then our second question, um, there's not a speaker um, specified, so I'll, I'll open it to the floor. What is the impact of emerging technologies on deterrence? Um, specifically, I think we're, we're asking about uh, the world going towards um, AI and cyber and keeping in mind also the, the crisis of the BrahMos missile um, being launched by India and landing in Pakistan. So um, if anyone wants to take that, then the floor is yours. I, I, maybe I can start, um, Zeba. You know, it, it's Murphy's Law at work. Um, if things are going to go wrong, they will. And uh, any amount of technology is really as good as the people behind it. And so uh, what we are seeing is the constant possibility that mistakes will be made, and then people will try and cover it up at the operational level. And when they do that, uh, the decision makers are ill-informed about exactly what's going on. And as a result, uh, wrong decisions can be made in a split second manner, which can lead to uh, uh, a rapid escalation. Um, and, and that is really uh, something, particularly for India and Pakistan, 
where uh, there is no uh, advance warning time. You know, the border is, is very uh, long and uh, the forces are right on the border. Uh, so uh, given the technologies, given the capacity to do a lot of damage, uh, using whatever kinds of nuclear weapons, so-called tactical weapons or real weapons, they're all nuclear. Once you open the, that box, uh, you've let all the genies out. And so it'll be very, very tough to, to roll back. Uh, I think I agree with Sushant that the, the Brahmas incident uh, was really, uh, you know, should have led to a lot of heads rolling on the Indian side. Um, and we haven't heard enough publicly about what happened in the follow-up to Brahmas. Um, and my suspicion is, as often happens in South Asia, that uh, the matter will be put under the carpet. And uh, we will pretend as if it didn't happen until it happens again. And then there may be a larger crisis the next time. Uh, yes, I think one thing that we've traced a lot, oh yes, Colin, go ahead, sorry. Yeah, no, just to, to jump on uh, this point that uh, Shucha is raising, I, I think uh, one of the things that's in the background is militaries, regardless of nationality, love acquiring new technologies. And the presumption in the background is to acquire a new technology is to move forward or towards this notion of return, restoring deterrence in the capability sense. Um, I think those of us who stare at the deterrence problem from a crisis stability point of view, often scratch our heads and say, is this acquisition in fact stabilizing or destabilizing? And they're very active discussions about this. Um, and we could get into this in detail on what is going on in, in South Asia currently. I would just say that the deeper the United States got into the Cold War uh, use and discussion of conventional and nuclear deterrence, the more concerned the United States professionals became about command and control issues. And this plays out in two ways in the contemporary setting. One is uh, how much authority is delegated or pre-delegated uh, to military decision makers, how much control do civilians have over uh, the use of these devastating weapons, uh, and what role does taking the human out of the decision process through the use of artificial intelligence, how does this potentially stabilize or fundamentally destabilize uh, what's going on. And, and this is a, a large topic. I'm not going to do it justice, but um, the command and control piece of it as Americans look at South Asia is very troubling. And we've had uh, ongoing discussions with Pakistan and India on why we think they should learn from our, uh, I won't call it mistakes, but uh, teething uh, pains uh, in ter terms of learning how to control these things safely and to minimize the chances of accidental use. The uh, I think the risk, uh, you know, I agree with both Shuza and Colin there. Colin, Colin makes some great point. But I think in case of uh, countries in South Asia, uh, the, the increasing gap in conventional capabilities actually makes newer technologies uh, in terms of in the, in the field of nuclear weapons, et cetera, more attractive for all these countries. You know, they're financially more affordable. They, 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 the risk is much lesser. You need in lesser quantity, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, and I think that's where the that's where the risk lies. You know, uh, as we have seen historically, technologies have only made weapons more deadlier, more more difficult to handle. Uh, no technology has made weapons sa safer. Only the human beings went there, whether it's a chemical weapon protocol or whether it was the biological weapon protocol. It is clear leaders who had to come together and decide that this cannot be used because left to itself, uh, technologies that have not have not helped uh, any any kind of weapons, and we shouldn't we shouldn't expect that they would help uh, nuclear weapons become less deadlier or more easier to use. Let me just add a quick footnote to this discussion. Um, in Pakistan, the SPD which is the strategic plans division that's responsible for the nuclear planning and assets, traditionally has been led by and guided by people from the artillery or the top khana as we call it in, in South Asia. Uh, and all artillery people uh, are really uh, embedded in the thinking, which is very linear, which is if you can increase the payload and if you can increase the, the range, that's all that matters. And you keep going up that, that route. Um, for them, the idea of, of de-escalation or the idea of, of, of stepping back and saying, what if we don't use these weapons uh, or make their use impossible? 
uh, doesn't really happen. And uh, this goes back to the point about delegation of authority that Colin mentioned. Uh, we actually uh, organized a session with uh, former uh, sec uh, late Secretary of State George Schultz, um, where, where he and, uh, and, and Secretary Perry both invited Indian and Pakistani nuclear experts uh, to Stanford to talk about this issue and to learn from the US experience with the Soviets uh, in the early days uh, about fighting under a nuclear overhang, a conventional war under a nuclear overhang. Um, quite frankly, since I sat in on all those meetings, uh, I don't think uh, either side walked away learning the lessons that Secretary Schultz meant to impart. Yes, this question of well, what we learned from the Cold War, what we learned from the U.S.-Soviet experience and how it's applied in Southern Asia is one that we've been tracing since you know, the first deterrence course uh, was released in 2020, and it's certainly at play here in restoring deterrence. Um, thank you to audience for your questions. Um, we'll go back to uh, moderator questions and then have one last round of uh, lightning round audience questions later. Um, in our remaining half hour. Um, so to, for my list, um, I think, Shuja, speaking of US experience in South Asia, I'm curious from, from yours and Colin's perspective about sort of the US role historically um, as a mediator of India-Pakistan crises. Um, I think that's been complicated by um, its increasing strategic competition with China, uh, as well as other challenges in the US-Pakistan relationship. Um, and I think that there is concern that U.S. influence of Pakistan may be increasingly limited in crisis, given that strategic competition and great power competition, um, on top of perceptions of the U.S. being sort of a declining power, at least as far as South Asia is concerned. Um, so for both of you, I'm curious as to your thoughts on whether the U.S. can continue to be an effective mediator of India-Pakistan crises and what actions the US government can take um, either independently or in collaboration with Pakistan or India um, to improve strategic stability in Southern Asia. Um, so Shuja, I'll go to you and then to Colin. Uh, my brief answer is the US should show some modesty in its ability. Uh, and that is based on the fact that it has over time lost its leverage, uh, both uh, with India and with Pakistan. Uh, with India, because India is now a kind of a poised superpower. Uh, it, it's, a, it's a huge economic power. It's expanding its influence. And uh, militarily, India is also going up the ladder, though it, it cannot compete with China. Uh, and uh, for the US to think that India can compete with China and, and force India into that competition in the Pacific is probably not a great idea. Uh, with Pakistan, there's almost no economic assistance going from the United States to Pakistan. So that leverage, which played a big role in convincing the Pakistani public and its leadership that the U.S. was a friend of Pakistan, is, has been diminished. So we, we need to take a, a more realistic look at, the, at our ability and not see the U.S. playing a mediator role, but playing more of a role as uh, an entity that can create an enabling environment that will allow the countries uh, in question, India and Pakistan, to reach the right conclusions. And for, to use economic assistance, not bilaterally, but through the multilateral international financial institutions, particularly for Pakistan, uh, to be able to put it back on its feet. Uh, because that is the biggest crisis that the country faces at the moment, is getting out of the hole that COVID put it into and that the Ukraine conflict is now added to uh, and, and the ups and downs of the energy prices of the world because it is so dependent on imported energy and imported food, in this case from Ukraine. So over the next, I would say, five years or more, Pakistan is going to be in that hole. And for the US to influence decision-making uh, in the country, it will really have to talk in terms of principles and consistency of US involvement in the region. Uh, the, the role of Afghanistan cannot be underestimated. 
the, the relationship between Afghanistan and Pakistan, which you know I'm sure we discuss separately, uh, needs to be looked at very carefully because that is going to determine Pakistan's actions in the region. Uh, I would agree wholeheartedly with Shuja's call for modesty and an acknowledgement of um, reduced U.S. leverage fee, uh, relative to the sort of historical norm. I do think the United States was both more influential, the great powers involved in the region were less powerful at earlier points in time. So there are a lot of reasons why I think it was an easier problem for the United States to address in the past than it is uh, in the present or the future. I would say though that what is undiminished, and I can say this as a former policymaker in this area, is the desire, the strident desire to avoid an explosion between uh, two South Asian uh, neighbors. So the problem is like, how do you pursue what is essentially a fixed goal, which is of the avoidance of major war, nuclear war in South Asia, if we're in a period of, of diminished uh, leverage? I mean, I would, I would pick up on a couple of Shuja's points. I mean, I think, the search certainly for a lot of the professionals in the space from the American point of view was, how can we find areas of cooperation with both India and Pakistan at a period uh, where those two parties are in tension and where great power competition between the United States and China is further muddling this issue? Um, I think certain factions on the US side say, okay, everything has to be subordinated to the US-China competition. And I think that that's a fairly bipartisan elite consensus. Um, that makes the management of this problem particularly difficult. There are people who would argue because Pakistan is increasingly aligned with China and the United States is increasingly aligned with India, uh, we cannot address these issues uh, without compromising our commitment to um, some struggle between two blocks. I, I find myself in a very different position. I think this is what makes policy hard but important. Um, I agree that we, we should be looking for areas where we can cooperate uh, with Pakistan in particular. Um, CT cooperation may be an area, uh, counterterrorism cooperation uh, in the wake of the Afghanistan withdrawal. Um, there may be areas, as Shuja points out, in the economic realm where uh, we can come to positive sum outcomes. Um, but I think the search for this and the commitment to trying to do this is very important from the American point of view, but it's not necessarily a majority opinion. And I think that's one of the things that's rather sobering looking at the American policy community. They're so fixated, understandably, on uh, the US-China competition that sometimes this pushes this very sensitive and very important problem into the background and makes it harder to, to, to manage. I, I pick up on a second point though too. One of the things we look at, whether it's in the South Asia context or let's say even in the Ukraine conflict is what the relationship between the conventional balance and nuclear risk is. And frequently I find myself at meetings making points like the way to buy down the risk of nuclear escalation is to look for conventional stability. Um, and this is a very old theme. Uh, it runs throughout the US Cold War experience. We backed away after the 1950s from a mostly nuclear uh, posture in the New Look policy to a flexible response one where we built up conventional capabilities in order to avoid the nuclear precipice. As I look at South Asia, what is worrisome is that the conventional imbalance is growing between Pakistan and India. And I agree that that increases the salience and the attractiveness of nuclear options, particularly for Pakistan. Um, this is a big problem. And I think not just the United States policy community, but the, the foreign policy community globally needs to think very carefully about this. Um, I think extreme instability or asymmetry and conventional strength, all things being equal, makes it a more dangerous um, situation for, for nuclear escalation. All right, thank you both. Um, we are about 20 minutes um, until we hit our end point. So I'm gonna be uh, ask the speakers to be more conscientious of two minutes per response. Um, and then we'll get into some last audience questions. Um, anyway, so first um, my, my question is for um, Sushant and Shuja to kind of think about uh, the so-called two front threat that India faces from China and Pakistan. Um, so Su yeah, Sushant, I'm sorry, ah, what a day today. Um, anyway, last year you pu you published a research note with the Simpson Center 
um, arguing that India lacks the resources to fight a two front war with China, Pakistan should one arise. Um, so how does the prospect of such a conflict complicate India's deterrence posture? And do, does the Indian army realignment um, suggest any change in strategy from the approach that you described uh, in that paper of assigning primary and secondary fronts, uh, which would be Pakistan and China respectively? Yeah, so uh, clearly a two-front war is a nightmare for Indian military planners and uh, Indian military leaders and the, pol and the political leaders. Now, that's a given. I, I it was this question has been asked of Indian military leadership a lot in the in the recent months uh, since the China border crisis began, and none of them, uh, and if you're uh, reading them carefully, listening to them carefully, none of them has actually said that we can handle uh, two fronts simultaneously. Uh, so as Zeba said, you know earlier the whole idea was that part, that the main front would be Pakistan and China would only try to try to come and put some pressure on us. So that would be the primary front for which India was prepared and China would be the secondary front because China had always been dealt diplomatically by the Indians and there was some kind of a stability in, in, in that scenario. Uh, Ladakh has completely you know, upturned that, that, that premise and, 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 br and brought this situation, situation home. Uh, what I hear from, uh, from military leaders and military planners is that the idea is actually to deter Pakistan with extreme punishment if it does anything while China is trying to, uh, while China is trying to do whatever it is doing on the border, if a threat from China emerges, then India is going to. India really doesn't have the resources to stop Pakistan from doing anything, except uh, you know threatening it, it with great punishment. And I think the phrase "great punishment," or very the significant punishment, or very you know whatever word military leaders may use, essentially signifies the use of nuclear weapons uh, at some of the uh, critical points. And I think that's that has what. I believe uh, further complicates the uh, complicates the uh, co complicates the situation uh, in this case. All right, thank you, Sushant. And then I I would look at the order of battle of India. Mm -hmm. uh, I think uh, it's significant that there's been some changes in that in that uh, troops have been moved from the the three strike corps facing Pakistan towards the Chinese border, but uh, much more perhaps could be done on that front, because the abiding concern inside the Pakistan military, and let's not fool ourselves, the decisions on the India-Pakistan military front are made by the military, much more than by civilian governments in Pakistan. And as General Kiani, the former army chief used to say, you have to look at the capability of the, the hostile forces, in this case, India, and if, if their capabilities are that they can advance quickly into Pakistani territory, occupy key cities, and then make Pakistan sue for peace, uh, then that's what Pakistan army would worry about. And that's what they'll prepare for. So the signaling effect of India actually reducing its strike forces and the independent brigade groups on the Pakistan border would be enormous in my view. Uh, it doesn't necessarily have to go into an advanced uh, offensive posture against China, but uh, maybe just a defensive posture against China uh, with, with enough space between the two forces to avoid the risk of unnecessary and accidental conflict in the Himalayas uh, would be one approach. Um, and that is something that the US can play a role in discussing with India and convincing them that, you know, there will be support for India, as there always has been. In 62, also, the US provided very rapid support to India. And remember, in 62, Pakistan had the opportunity of opening another front against India, and it chose not to, because it would be foolish of Pakistan to get involved in a two-front war, uh, because it would suddenly incur the wrath of the whole of the world, particularly the Western world, uh, for taking advantage of that uh, Chinese-Indian conflict. So in my view, I think a lot depends on the posture India wants to create in the region. Uh, it can remove the fear that, that resides very deep in the Pakistani psyche about the potential for India to march into Pakistan and break it into two or three pieces. Uh, and if that fear can be removed, then maybe they can talk about other ways of opening that border to trade and travel rather than uh, as, a, as a path for military ingress. 
uh, just to add to what Shuja said, you know, uh, not disputing anything what he has said. Uh, the fact of the matter is that uh, before the border crisis with, uh, with China began in Ladakh, the Indian political leadership in public speeches, in public addresses, had taken a very aggressive stance against Pakistan. Mr. Modi, in fact, is on a in a, in, a, in an election rally, went on to say that uh, that the nuclear weapons that India has have not have not been kept for the festival of Diwali. Uh, Mr. Doval is on record with very aggressive statement. The Prime Minister's most significant speech in India is on the Independence Day from the Ramtat of the Red Fort, where he once spoke about Balochistan and, and, and all those things. So the stance had been very aggressive, uh, very almost like, you know, that we are going to teach Pakistan a lesson kind of a thing. Uh, but the China crisis completely has shifted. So have the intentions changed, as Shuja was saying, that the military planners in Rawalpindi look at the intentions, uh, look at the capabilities, not the intentions. I think even the intentions have not really changed. They, they, whatever has happened has been forced by the Chinese threat, which has which is built upon the border. All right. Thank you both. Um, Ketan, did you have anything to add about the prospect of two fronts um, competition or two front war with China and Pakistan against India or anything else that the others have said today? Yeah, I was actually about to raise like a two finger. I think I mean I agree with both as Shujan and Shuja, um, but at the same time, I think at least from from my from from what I know, um, the prospect of a Sino-Indian war over the border dispute seems to be relatively low. And just because I think, um, as Sujan mentioned, intentions are important, right? And I think the intentions where the stakes for China, for China are just uh, relatively lower. Um, the, the, the stakes for Taiwan is a lot higher than compared to um, India. And uh, uh, although territorial integrity is China's core interest, but individual territorial disputes, for example, those with the rocks in the South China Sea or with uh, or along the LAC is simply not considered a core interest to uh, the, the Chinese government. But what that means is that although we're going to probably continue to see skirmishes, you know, in the in the future or lower level conflict at a very localized uh, level, but um, I, I just don't see China sort of intentionally going into war with India over the territorial disputes. And, and especially if we see or look at Sino-Indian relations at the moment, the, the disputes, the land border disputes tend to be very compartmentalized, right? So both sides are fairly um, uh, cooperative on a lot of other fronts, including economic fronts or climate change and other things. Um, and, and they communicate very uh, fairly regularly when it comes to uh, land border disputes. So the, the although I think it's important for India to, to think about a potential two front war, but at the same time, um, I just think that the likelihood when it comes to China uh, having a war with India over um, the LSC is relatively uh, low. All right. Thank you, Ketchian. I think that's valuable perspectives. Um, with that, I'm going to close out this round of questions and transition back to our audience questions before we wrap up for the day. Um, so first, I think, Ketchian, to your point about the Ladakh and the land border with India not being a core interest to India, uh, to China, I'm sorry. Um, but it is a core interest for, for India, I think. Um, the question from the audience is, how are th changing threat perceptions in Southern Asia impacting de deterrence dynamics between Pakistan, and India, and China? Um, so I think that, you know, differing threat perceptions, changing threat perceptions. Sushanti, you're also talking about this and how the 2020 crisis sort of um, upended this in a lot of ways for India. So um, maybe open this to the floor um, to whoever who would want to answer that, and, and then we can go from there. Maybe I can open on the conventional side, um, based on my understanding from conversations with people inside Pakistan over the last few years. Pakistan is in a very comfortable position, uh, despite the conventional asymmetry between India and Pakistan. Uh, the reason being that um, you know it's like old sparring partners. India and Pakistan know each other so well. And they know each other's geography so well that you can basically close your eyes and, and be able to predict exactly where the opposition is going to come from, where the ingress will be, where you have to defend. And Pakistan has over time moved its forces in such a way as to prevent that kind of a very rapid uh, attack from the Indian side in order to occupy territory and make Pakistan sue for peace. So by moving uh, the armored div uh, from the north to 
to further uh, near the Indian border in, in Pakistan, um, they've, they've created uh, a, a barrier to Indian in, ingress in, into Pakistan. Uh, they, they would probably be willing to give up territory in the South, uh, but that territory may not be as strategically important in the context of India-Pakistan. So these calculations mean that there is already some kind of uh, stability on the conventional side. It's really the nuclear side where, and these are the issues that Colin raised, where the issues of devolution of responsibility uh, or, you know, for, for the use of so-called tactical weapons becomes a reality. And the possibility that by moving small weapons around or instead of having them demated by mating them so they can be used rapidly creates the possibility of accidents or them, the weapons landing in the wrong hands uh, creates further instability. Those are things that I think still need to be resolved. Uh, I, uh, you know, what Shruja said about Pakistan is absolutely true. As far as India is concerned, I think uh, a lot of it is about the the kind of politics that's happening in India today and the very uh, high pitched nationalist rhetoric. And I think that somehow brings a danger with it uh, to the kind of ties that India has with Pakistan, uh, because we've already seen two highly publicized operations inside Pakistan. You can Control territory, one, one called the surgical strikes, another the, the Balakot air strike. And that leaves me worried about uh, about where it could go in, into, into the future, the, the very the, the raised nationalist rhetoric in India uh, for political goals. All right, thank you both. Um, if no one else has anything to add, I think uh, maybe one last or second to last question. Um, I think one of one of the key lessons um, from my perspective of restoring deterrence and a lot of what we do at the Simpson Center is thinking about the eye of the beholder problem um, and differing perceptions of the status quo. This is what the last question was about. And we've been talking about that um, all this morning or this evening, depending on where you are, from the Taiwan issue, from the India-China border issue. Um, so I think my question for all of you would be, um, considering this problem, the eye of the beholder problem, um, making it difficult to, deter to determine who is deterring and who is compelling in a rivalry, how could observers of strategic dynamics in this region critically interpret actions and rhetoric that they hear on these issues? Um, so I'll open that to everybody. Uh, maybe start with Colin and then go to Ketian, Sushant, and Shuja. So I, I think the, the most important aspect for outside observers is to exercise not necessarily sympathy with any of the players, but empathy. In other words, the ability to sort of stand in the shoes, virtually speaking, of each of the, the uh, parties in the conflict and understand contextually whether these messages are likely to be primarily private, let's say, messages uh, to the adversary, or are they playing, as, as Sushant has alluded to, to domestic audiences in an attempt to sort of um, indulge nationalist impulses. So I think a lot of the, the, the challenge of being a, a third party observer here is to disentangle this. I can't give you a, a stable answer to how one does that other than the sense of uh, not to treat this um, in a surface way on any of these messages. I mean, I think from the US point of view, typically we're looking not only at rhetoric, but at movement of capabilities, what people are doing in, in practical terms, and some, some uh, summation of those two things is what we're sort of uh, basing our appreciation potentially. Um, so, so for me, I think uh, maybe one way to get around with the issue of deciding who is deterrent, who is compelling, um, is to be open to the idea, and this is something that I've been working on in my book manuscript as well, uh, which is to be open to the idea that sometimes states are simply compelling to deter, right? So we're seeing a lot, I think, in the Sana Indian as well as uh, the Tom Wen Stray sort of cases in the sense that uh, China, for example, is uh, using coercion or compellence to deter future occurrences of what it thinks to be uh, a, 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 a breach to, say, the status quo. Uh, and same thing for 
or I think India and to a certain extent the United States as well. So in a way, compellants and uh, deterrence, they're not necessarily um, separate from one another, which is sort of what the, the standard literature implies. But I think there is a blurred line between what is compellence and what is um, deterrence. And in addition, I very much agree with um, Colin in that uh, we need to really objectively assess what are the goals or intentions of all parties involved instead of just assigning normative judgment of what is wrong or what is right. It is important to, to, to have normative judgment, but I think uh, for our purposes, it's really important to understand the intentions of, um, uh, of ourselves as well as the, the adversary. Uh, to add to what Colin and uh, Katian said, uh, the only thing you, you can do is actually build uh, for outside observers, and I, I presume you're 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 referring to the United States or other global powers, is to actually uh, build long-term relationships, uh, generate some kind of trust, and that would provide you the better understanding of the intentions of the of the words that are used and what what is meant. Uh, and the context in which those words are being said, you know, this is something which you need to do over a long period of time. You can't just go in at the last moment and and uh, and hope to understand what the people are trying to say, what they're signaling or or what they're doing or what they intend doing. And I think that's something which is particularly relevant in case of Pakistan uh, today uh, when it comes to the United States. On my part, um, looking at it as a Pakistani American, and particularly from the U.S. point of view, I would uh, advise the U.S. to try and maintain uh, a steady uh, uh, quantum of expertise on the region. Um, we have a habit of, of rapidly moving people around and taking away experience. And, and even now, I was very amused to, to learn We've just sent a new ambassador to Pakistan who has no experience in the country, but obviously is a trained diplomat. And, and now we're sending a new deputy uh, chief of mission to Pakistan also. So I think that's very important to retain continuity and to retain a critical mass of expertise vis-a-vis uh, -vis a country. The other point, uh, which picks up on what Sushant and I have been talking about throughout this session, is um, the ability of populist governments to appeal to domestic audiences, which has been the case in India. And the more that India takes goes down that route, my fear is that it will provoke a similar kind of reaction inside Pakistan. And to some extent, the populist rhetoric of Imran Khan reflects the populist rhetoric of, of Modi in India in my view. And so you're going to have this constant tussle between populist forces uh, that will create in internal dynamics that are not conducive to creating peace and stability, uh, and that make it very tough to friends like the United States or Western powers to then intervene uh, in a more positive way. Uh, it, it really destroys the the, the internal dynamics uh, within the countries. Now, the reality as I see it in Pakistan is that across the spectrum, political parties have been looking to open the border to the East for trade and for traffic. And even the military uh, had, had created support for trade with India, in, including in the days when Mr. Zardari was president, the military actually approved the idea of opening trade uh, with India and granting MFN status to India. But it was Mr. Zardari's decision based on domestic political considerations because of upcoming elections uh, that the agriculturalists in Punjab forced him to, to go back on that pledge to India. And that kind of started the slide in the relationship with India. So I think we have to take into account these domestic dynamics um, when we look at it from the outside. All right, thank you so much, everyone. Um, that essentially brings us to time. Um, so I have, you know, pages and pages of additional questions that I would love to ask you, but this has been just a fantastic session. So thank you so much, Ketian, Sushant, Colin, and Shuja. 
uh, and to all of you for joining. Um, I think this has been such an edifying and an intriguing conversation. And honestly, it is just the tip of the iceberg as I think we, we've certainly dug into today. Um, I think for the questions and debates and study of coercion and, and crises and competition in Southern Asia. So if this conversation has intrigued you, if there are elements you wanna dig into, if there's deterrence theory that you wanna brush up on, um, or if there's anything else that you wanna follow up on, then I cannot encourage you enough to go to stratlearning.org and enroll in Restoring Deterrence or any of our strategic learning courses for yourself. Um, they're, they're useful, they're fun uh, to take as a student, I promise. And they're really unique uh, resources, whether you're uh, just starting out working on these issues or if, you've, uh, if you're a, an old hand. Uh, so I hope you'll enjoy it. I hope you'll learn and engage with these scholars and so many more. Um, so thank you again to everyone for joining us today. Thank you to our panelists, to Elizabeth for, con for being our convener today. Um, and thank you again so much and have a fabulous rest of your day.